As most of you know, a few weeks ago, I was on a trip to Israel. I was there with a tour group, and the group was made up of 40 pastors from all over uh, the United States. A few people knew each other, but most all of us were strangers. We'd never met each other from, from all different locations. Young guys, old guys, church planners, established church guys, you know, the, just a really good mix. So we spent a lot of time together getting to know each other. We had breakfast and dinner together each day, and so we would chit-chat and talk and try to find out, you know, what, what each person was like. And so early on, one of the guys just threw out like an icebreaker. He said, all right, why don't we just go around and everybody just share what, what you're preaching? Just one by one, go around. When you get back, what are you going to be preaching just so we can kind of find out more about each other? So they kind of went around the table, and it got to me. And I said, well, when I get back, i got two weeks in Romans. We're just emphasizing service. We just need that reminder. I said, and then after that, I'm going to start into my next book study. So at that point, I was hoping they would just move on to the next guy. <laughs> but they didn't. Somebody asked the follow-up question, oh, what book are you going to study? And I said, Leviticus. And they looked at me like a curse word came out of my mouth. They looked at me <laughs> like, are you crazy? Like, are you seriously going to preach through the book of Leviticus? So call me naive. I didn't realize that this was as maybe unusual or as rare as it is. And I'm, I'm actually kind of curious. I asked the early service, how many of you have been in a church where on Sunday, I don't mean like a class or a book you read or something. How many have been on a church uh, where on Sunday, they went through and did a, a, an overview, a series, through the book of Leviticus. Raise your hands. How many? Two. <laughs> oh, three. No, I see one more over here. I think in the early service we might have had eight uh, that I counted. So um, that should tell you something, right? This is weird, okay? This is unusual. And so I, I know it can be a little bit odd, and some of you maybe tried to read this week and found yourself struggling. So I want to I take a quick moment and explain why we're doing this. And I want to give you two reasons why we're, we're, we're doing this. Now, this is not my introduction. This is the introduction to my introduction, okay? So just, just hang tight with me. This is not appearing on the screen. I just, this was an afterthought to kind of get us all on the same page, all right? So the reason I'm doing this is, is number one, I'm preaching through Leviticus because the book of Hebrews has an important message for us. So last year, my first thought was, boy, I'd like to preach through Hebrews. So I picked it up, was reading it, studying it, thinking about it. And you know what I discovered? The author of Hebrews assumes that his readers understand the book of Leviticus. He throws out words, and he talks about things like the sacrificial system and the priesthood and the tabernacle, and he doesn't define them. He just assumes you have a working knowledge of, of what this book is about. So as I, I thought about this, I concluded that those who do not fully understand Leviticus will not fully appreciate Hebrews. And so that's where we're going. After this study, we're going to push over into the book of Leviticus. And by the way, let me just for a moment, I want to go a step further, that a deeper understanding of Leviticus will also give you a deeper appreciation of the gospel. Now, I want you to think about that for a second, because so much, we don't even realize it, so much of our vocabulary about Jesus, so much of what we celebrate about Christ is rooted in the book of Leviticus. When, when we sing, For our sins He suffered and bled and died, that idea of a substitutionary sacrifice comes from Leviticus. When we eat the Lord's Supper and say that His blood cleanses our sins, that idea of atonement comes from Leviticus. When, when we pray in Jesus' name, it's because there's one mediator between God and man, and that idea of a priesthood comes to us from Leviticus. So if you think of it in those terms, but if I explain it this way, 
Before many students take calculus, you have to take pre-calculus, right? That's what gets you ready, right? So before we can take the gospel class called Hebrews, we need to take the pre-gospel class called Leviticus. It's getting us ready for... Leviticus is not the gospel, but boy, it will sure get you ready for the gospel. And that's what we want to do. Our Leviticus series is kind of groundwork for the Hebrews series. So, first of all, I'm preaching Leviticus because the book of Hebrews has an important message for us. But number two, I'm also preaching the book of Leviticus because the book of Leviticus has an important message for us. I say that because my my fear sometimes is that we only see Leviticus as a means to an end. That we only read Leviticus so that we can just eventually get to Hebrews. That we read Leviticus like my kids eat Brussels sprouts. (laughs) All right, if I have to chew and swallow this to get dessert, then I'll do it, you know. But it's kind of, ugh, we just, it's begrudging in that sense. And so sometimes when we come to this book, we're, we're, we're reading it only to kind of, we don't really know what to do with it, and it's all over the place, and we find ourselves and, and, and just wanting to get past it. But listen, I really do think, and I want to show you in this series, that Leviticus has its own delicious message for us to hear. That yes, Leviticus, it it does undergird so much of Hebrews and really the gospel, but it's not just about ancient rules for ancient people. It contains a timeless message about God that we still need to hear. Now, what is that message? Well, that's what we're going to get to today at the end of this introduction as we look at the basics of the book of Leviticus. So my point is, Leviticus, we're going to see it both as a means to an end and in some ways as an end in itself. And to listen to God's message from this one, uh, this portion of his word. By the way, one, one last little comment before we start. Um, and it, usually when churches or pastors, when you study through the book of Leviticus, the study, usually it, it requires a whole bunch of charts and graphs and pictures and you know this furniture and this thing and this that okay listen i know the engineers those of you guys you love that stuff the rest of us normal people do not okay I'm just kidding just kidding but, but you can kill the study just because it's that there is a lot of detail and i'm really going to try if you want to do that great please do okay What I want to do, though, is not get lost in the details. I want to kind of step back and say, what do these rules, when you kind of put them together, what are they teaching us? What are they revealing about God that's still true for us today? So, you know, if you want to look at those things, please do. Honestly, the best thing that you can do to help your benefit from this study, honestly, the best thing you can do is to take the bulletin and read along. Just... For your devotion time, as a family, we do this together. Just read along. It's out. It's there. It's on the website. Just read in advance because I can't study every verse. I can't do that. But we're going to look at kind of the major themes. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? So I don't think we're going to have a whole bunch of charts and graphs and stuff. I mean, you're welcome, but I'm not going to do that. We're going to look at the major lessons that this book here uh, teaches us. And so to get us started in that, today we're going to just cover some introductory material. We're going to look at three aspects of Leviticus, the background, the outline, and the message. Again, if you're taking notes, we'll look at the background, the outline, and the message. So if you have your Bibles open, Leviticus, I'd like you to look at chapter 1, verse 1. I want to read this one verse and then uh, briefly pray, and then we'll start our message this morning. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1. Then the Lord called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying. Let's pray. Father, now we pray that you will bless our study. Lord, may this introduction be helpful. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, minds to grasp and understand what is profitable about this portion of Scripture. We know that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, Lord, help us to see its its profit, its benefit to us even today. 
Bless our time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> a few months ago, I was watching a Q&A session with a, a NASA engineer. And somebody asked him the question about uh, sending a manned mission to Mars. They said, is it, is it going to happen in our lifetime?" And so he started explaining some of the obstacles that come with with such an event. He said, you know, going to Mars is not like going to the moon. There's a lot of challenges. He said, well, first of all, just time, right? Best case scenario, six months there, six months back. So you're talking an entire year, which raises other obstacles. How do you put that much fuel on a space shuttle? How do you put that much food and water on a space shuttle? How do you deal with the psychological you know, details? I mean, being in that environment for that long, all of those are, are real challenges that stand in our way. But then he surprised me. He said, but actually, we have answers to almost all those questions. He said, but we still have one obstacle that stands in our way. One question that we have yet to answer. He said, the real challenge with a mission to Mars is the issue of radiation. He said, now you all know if you spend too much time out on the beach or in the sun, here here on earth you can get melanoma. If you travel 250 million miles closer to the sun, its rays become lethal. He said, if we could get a person even to Mars and back in like four months, a a ridiculous amount of time, by the time they got back, they would be completely eaten up with cancer. He says, we we don't have metal thick enough or insulation thick enough yet. We haven't quite figured up how to deflect the sun's poisonous radiation when you get that close to it. Now, that tells us something very peculiar about the sun. Right, we all know on the one hand that the sun is good. It gives us light, it gives us heat, we mark time by it. In fact, Jesus referred to it as a gift of common grace, right? God causes the sun to shine on the good and the evil. So we all know its benefits, it's good. But as that NASA engineer pointed out, there is a sense in which at the same time that the sun is good, the sun is also extremely dangerous. And if you are not properly equipped to get close to the sun, it will destroy you. Well, what's true of the sun, in a very real sense, is also true of God. God's holy presence is good. God's presence is perfectly good. And beneficial. And yet, one thing that we find quite clear in the Bible, particularly this portion of the Bible, is that God's good presence can also be extremely dangerous. And the nation of Israel had to learn this lesson the hard way. So, if we really want to understand the book of Leviticus, we have to actually get a running start and go back a little bit to the book of Exodus. So if you'll turn with me back a few pages to Exodus chapter 32, we come to what is the situation in the background of the book of of Leviticus. Exodus chapter 32. Now again, just to kind of get us all caught up, Israel was enslaved in Egypt. They were there in that place and God sends Moses to them and he tells the people, God comes to, or Moses comes to the people of Israel and he says it is time to, to rise up and to leave their slavery, to rise up and to leave Egypt. He calls them to come out of that place and to come into God's land. And so Moses brings them out of that place by miracles and by God's hand, and he comes to Mount Sinai. And there at Mount Sinai, something really special happens. The best way I can describe it is that God and Israel have a wedding ceremony. God publicly pledges His undying devotion and commitment to them as His special people, and Israel in turn says, yes, we we accept. And so now this special relationship is formed between God and Israel, a relationship that no other nation has with God. And so they they have this special relationship, and so Israel sees all that God has done, and their first reaction is, wow, God is good. 
I mean, the Exodus is proof of that. The miracles, the deliverance, the victory, all of this proves to us that God is good. And so what do they do? They want to celebrate that God is good. They, they want to, to worship Him. And so, so what do they do? They do the best thing that they know how. They say, well, we ought to worship this God that we're just kind of rem- being introduced to in some sense. So we need to worship Him. So how do we do that? Well, let's just do what we did in Egypt. Let's just copy what we saw there. So Moses asks the people for gold and they boil it down, excuse me, melt it down. And it says in verse 4 of 32, Aaron took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and he made it into a molten calf. And they said, this is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now notice they didn't say, here's a false God, let's worship him. They said, this is the God who brought us out. There's a, clearly a confusion. They're trying to worship God. They're, they're trying to celebrate Him. And it says that they sing and they brought offerings and the people sat down to eat and drink. There's this celebration that unfolds and yet they're, they're going about it in a way that, that, that is offensive. And when God sees this, He is ticked off. If you skip down to verse 7, then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people, whom you brought up from the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. And then if you skip down to verse 10, Now then, God says, Leave me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them. Wow! The very God who brought them out of Egypt, is now threatening to commit genocide against them. And Israel shockingly discovers that this God who, who, who rescues people also kills people. Now I know that's a very uncomfortable truth, but it is a truth. And, 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 and Israel is faced with this very sobering fact. Yes, we believe that God is love, but we also believe that our God is a consuming fire. And so Moses risks his life. He goes to God and says, no, 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 please don't do this. And so he calls out to God and he, he basically, he, that, that through their discussion and through his prayers and through his intercession, God relents from his plan to destroy them. And it says that instead, as kind of consolation, Moses comes down and they kill 3,000 people. Now 3,000 is a pretty small number compared to a million or whatever it was. So God wants to wipe out the nation because they they worshipped Him in the wrong way. And now we find here that a few people die, not as many as should, but a few people die. And so everything at this point, kind of the dust settles. Then what happens? Well, if you know the rest of Exodus, in chapters, if you flip 36, 37, 38, 39, and then we come to 40, what happens? God tells Israel, okay, now that that thing is done, I want you to build me a house. And I'm moving in your neighborhood. I'm I'm going to live right in your streets, right in your community. I'm going to live right there among you. There's a sense in which Moses, like if you know the movie, Filled of Dreams, he says, if you build it, he will come. Put the tabernacle up and God's presence is going to come and fill this place. And so if you get to Exodus chapter 40, verse 34, it says, After the tabernacle was built, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle, and Moses was not able to enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled on it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So the presence of God fills this place, And Moses cannot enter. He cannot go there. He's kept out. Now, you can just imagine how the nation of Israel must have felt. I don't know about you, but I would have been pretty terrified. This this God who just threatened to wipe us all out now lives right here among us? Our children play over there. Like, what's he going to do? I mean, imagine having a nuclear reactor right next door to your house. It would have some pretty big advantages, but it might come with some pretty big disadvantages. 
And, and there's a sense in which there, Israel is left thinking, we tried to worship God, and we did the best way that we knew how, and it made him angry, so how do we avoid this again? How do we, as sinful people, live in the presence of this sinless God? The answer is the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus is the way in which God answers that dilemma. In fact, if you notice, something interesting happens in Leviticus from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. If you'll look at Leviticus chapter 1 again, back at chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Then the Lord God called to Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting. Right? Now keep a finger there and flip over to the next book, Numbers, and go to Numbers chapter 1. Numbers chapter 1, verse 1. Notice what happens here. Sounds very similar, but there's a small difference. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai in the tent of meeting. See the difference? Leviticus 1 1, God spoke to him from the tent. In other words, God is inside, Moses is outside because he can't go in. But now in Numbers, Moses and God are inside having a conversation. What's the difference between the end of Leviticus, excuse me, what's the difference between the end of Exodus and the beginning of Numbers? Leviticus. It's, It's the book of Leviticus that enables Moses and the people of Israel to understand how they can enjoy and indwell in the presence of God even though they are sinful people. In fact, what I find fascinating about this is that in chapter 1, verse 1 of Leviticus, it says, the Lord God called to Moses and spoke to him. In other words, God took the initiative to tell them how to do this. God knew the danger that they were potentially in. And so God is the one who comes to them, and God says to them, I'm going to give you... Moses doesn't come up with this. God comes and says, here is the step-by-step plan by which you can have ongoing contact and fellowship with me and not be burnt to a crisp. These are the rituals, the sacrifices, the procedures that God prescribes for Israel to use and do in order to maintain a good, healthy relationship with Him. Now, we all know the quote, those who forget history are what? They're doomed to repeat it. And apparently that happens in the book of Leviticus because you get halfway through the book, or at least part of the way through the book, there's a point where two guys, Nadab and Abihu, apparently forgot about the golden calf. And they began to think to themselves, oh, it doesn't really matter how you come into the presence of God. It doesn't really matter how you approach God. You can sort of do whatever you want. It doesn't matter. We can just kind of do those things. And so Nadab and Abihu, they try to come into the presence of God with strange fire, and Nadab and Abihu drop dead. And God is telling Israel, I'm serious. I'm not joking. I am a holy God, and to, to treat me tritely, to, 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 to pretend that, that I'm, I'm nothing or that you can do whatever you want is to completely misunderstand who I am. Leviticus reminds us that God is serious about His holiness and God's people should be too. My friends, listen to me closely. These ritual prescriptions... These ritual prescriptions from God, they have changed. But the character of God has not changed. And we need to stop and ask ourselves, do we understand God to be perfectly holy? Or do we see Him as so many do in a very demeaning way as a buddy or a pal or a friend? Nadab and Abihu tried that, and it didn't work out very well for them. And so Leviticus is God's way of teaching and reminding the people that He is a holy God, that we should stand in awe before Him, in worship and reverence, and approach Him only in the way that He prescribes. 
So all of that background helps us to see a few details of the book. I've, I've mentioned it, them hinted, but let me make them explicit here. We see the situation as the end of Exodus, the tabernacle is built. Who's the author of the book? Well, many scholars debate this issue, but I think Scripture has something to say about it. First and Second Chronicles says that Moses wrote it. Ezra said that Moses wrote it. Nehemiah said that Moses wrote it. Malachi said that Moses wrote it. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John said that Moses wrote it. Paul, on several occasions, said that Moses wrote it. And guess what? Moses said that Moses wrote it. And to top it all off, in Luke chapter 5, verse 14, our Lord himself said that Moses wrote it. So let the scholars generate their heat. I will take the light of Scripture any day. Scripture says that Moses wrote the book of Leviticus. So Moses wrote this book and receives this revelation from God. When? Well, we've already said at, after the Exodus, again, just big round numbers, roughly 1400 B.C. This is the time right after the Exodus. Now, if you're interested, again, you may not have seen this, but if you compare Leviticus 1.1 to Numbers 1.1, there's a really small little detail that's helpful. It says in Leviticus 1.1 that God spoke to Moses, it says, on the first day of the first month, by analogy, January 1st. Numbers 1.1 says that God spoke to Moses on the first day of the second month. By analogy, February 1st. So the entire book is revealed to Moses in just a month's time. There's not really but two events in the book. It's mostly just the sort of law code given from God, revealed to Moses to be written down and, and to be passed on to the people of Israel. So the dating is roughly 1400 B.C. after the Exodus. And of course, the time span of the entire book is just about one month. So that is the background to Leviticus. Now, what about the outline? Let's move on to that. Well, Leviticus has really a great shape to it. And, 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 and not only that, but it is part of something else that gives a great shape. Now, most of you hopefully are familiar. There's a word that we have, a special word for the first Five books of the Old Testament. You know what those are called? We call those the Pentateuch, right? Penta, Pentagon, five sides, five books, okay? Those are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Those five books are the books of the law or the books of Moses, right? What's interesting about those is if you look at them, in Hebrew writing and in sort of Hebrew culture, when they wrote things, very often the way that they would arrange them is that they would arrange them in such a way that whatever was in the middle was most significant. So if you use my hand here, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. In fact, if you compare the books, Genesis and Deuteronomy have a lot of things in common. A covenant is made and it's renewed there in front of the people. Exodus and Numbers has a lot in common. There's wanderings and plagues and miracles that happen. And guess what stands in the middle of all that? Leviticus. Because Leviticus becomes a very significant book to the life and the practice of the people. If you remember, at the end of Exodus, basically God says to Israel, worship me. And they said, we tried. And that didn't work out very well. And God says, hold on, you got ahead of me. You didn't give me time to explain what I meant about how to worship me. So, so God comes along and he explains that to them. Now, maybe this is a bad analogy. Forgive me if it is. But every Sunday when you come to church, we give you one of these, right? This is, this is the bulletin, okay? Um, very sacred object in Baptist worship. So here is the bulletin, right? But what, what does it do for us? It gives us kind of the order of service, you know, the songs and that kind of stuff. Who's, who's preaching, doing what? You have announcements. You got the budget. You got the scripture reading. You know, the text. You, over here, you have Lord's Supper when that is. On the back, it talks about our leadership. talks about some of the other details. You know, it's all kind of contained in this. Now, imagine coming to church and imagine we, if we didn't even have a, we didn't have a bulletin, but we also had no structure. Like some Sundays you came in and there's these seats, some weeks there's nothing there, some days there's lawn chairs, maybe couches, rugs. Sometimes you come and we sing, sometimes we watch a movie, sometimes this person's leader, sometimes that person's leader. I mean, just imagine the chaos. There wasn't, what, what did Paul say? All things in the church should be done decently and in order. Right, that's clear. Right? And so this kind of helps. It's not required, but that's it, it kind of helps. Right? So, so there's a sense in which before Leviticus, the people tried to worship God on their own, in their own way, and it was chaos. It was confusion, and it was really bad for them. So what did God do? God graciously comes to them, and he hands them the bulletin called Leviticus. 
here's the order of service. Here's the order of sacrifices. Here's who your leader should be. Here's how it is that you're supposed to worship me. And God comes to them, and He very graciously shows them how it is that they can come into His presence. And notice, at the golden calf, they tried to worship the right God, but they did it in the wrong way. Now, they can worship the right God in the right way and do it with confidence and assurance, knowing that He will be pleased and will bless them. Think how big of a, of a blessing and a relief that was to Israel. Because that didn't work out very well. So Leviticus is God giving them a kind of bulletin, if you will. And, and if you think about it, there is a sense in which that, that the, the book of Leviticus is extremely important to the history of Israel and the Pentateuch because it enables them to have this, this relationship and to walk in their relationship with God. So that's kind of an outline around the book. What about inside the book? Well, Leviticus is 27 chapters. It takes about two hours to read from beginning to end. And those 27 chapters are arranged in a really special way. Now, I told the early service, uh, I said, I I explained this to my kids this way. I said, God made the book of Leviticus the way that I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Okay? When I make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich... I have bread on top and bread on the bottom. Then there's a layer of peanut butter. And on the bottom, there's a layer of peanut butter. And then in the middle is the good stuff, right? right, So there's there's matching bread, matching peanut butter, and then right in the middle is the, the, the jelly, right? The book of Leviticus is arranged that way. Now, there's there's one more layer in Leviticus than there was there, so some people got mad at me for the analogy, but um, so there, there's these matching sort of things happening at the beginning and the end, and at the beginning and the end, at the beginning and the end, and it all builds down to this, this, this really sweet spot in the middle of the book, all right? So I want to I give it to you. It's going to show up on the screen in, in, in matching pairs, all right? So the book begins and ends with the issue of rituals, okay? Rituals. In chapters 1 through 7, God gives the people ritual sacrifices. These are those offerings. If you've ever started Leviticus and didn't finish it, you at least got through this part, right? The grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, the peace offering, the burnt offering. These are the offerings that they can offer to tell God they're sorry, to tell God thank you, to come into His presence, to approach Him. At the end of the book, it closes with more rituals, and that in part is a ritual calendar. God says, when are you going to do these offerings? Oh, yeah. At the end of the book, he says, you're going to have Sabbaths, and you're going to have uh, uh, Passover. You're going to have the year of Jubilee. And he gives these special holidays that they are to keep in mind every year and to commemorate. He also gives them some ritual laws at the end of how to deal with poor people, how to deal with slaves, and, yes, how to deal with refugees. So he he gives these rituals to them at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book. And that sort of is, is the starting point. Inside of that is another matching pair. These are the priests. In chapters 8 through 10, God says, all right, you need some leadership. So he says the leaders are going to be the sons of of Aaron. And he explains that it's going to be those who are (coughs) the sons of Aaron. We speak elsewhere, the tribe of Levi. They're the ones who are going to serve in this way. By the way, that's where the name of the book comes from. Leviticus means means a handbook for the Levites, pertaining to the Levites. So he says there, the, these are the priests. Then in chapters 21 and 22, he says, and by the way, for future generations, they need to be qualified. Don't just throw any of Aaron's sons up there. Be sure that they should be serving. And so he gives them these sort of qualifications to examine them for future service. All right, everybody with me still? We got rituals, then inside of that we have priests. Inside of that, we have a pair called purity. In chapters 11 through 15, God gives them, and and this section is what I call separation laws. Separation laws. And these laws are given to them so that they will look different than the nations around them. Right? Here's the thing. They're not only supposed to know God, what are they supposed to do? Represent God. So he gives them these very specific laws, and these are the ones we have a hard time with. Chapters 11 through 15, those purity laws, they include issues of food. You know, they're told there, well, you know, you can't eat 
you know, bats or pelicans or hawks or stuff that I'm thinking, who, who's catching those in the first place to eat them? But regardless, you're not supposed to eat them, right? And so he goes through these lists of foods you can't eat, and then he goes through this weird section about diseases and things that ooze and like, oh, rashes and eczema and all this stuff. And his point is what? These things make you unclean. Now, and so he says, you are to be clean and you're to be separate and distinct from the other nations. And then in chapters 8 through into through 20, he gives them more separation laws, and here he picks up and talks about issues of sexuality, worship, and issues of life and death. In other words, when it comes to these issues of morality, sexuality, and worship, and life and death, you are not to look like the, Pan- the Canaanites or the pagans. Don't look like them, don't act like them, be different from them. And so here he gives them these purity, these separation laws. Now, by the way, we'll get into this in a couple of weeks, but I I forgot to say this in the early service. Um, If you can start now, um, kind of, for most of us, untrain your brain. (laughs) To be unclean is not necessarily to be sinful. There are things you could do that were good that made you unclean. And you had to bathe or whatever it was in a period of time. But it's not necessarily the same, same thing as being sinful. So that's a weird category for us because we don't really have that. But that's where, again, I'm saying the point is separation laws to make them look distinct from those around them. All right, so you see it? Rituals, rituals, priests, priests, purity, purity. And then we get to the middle, the delicious sweet spot. And in the middle of the book, chapter 16 and 17, is the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement was the holiday of holidays where the people would come or, and two goats would be brought to the priests. And you say, but wait a minute, I thought they offered sacrifices for all other sins. Those were sins that they knew about. The Day of Atonement was for all the sins, even the ones they didn't know about. And the priest would put his hands on the goats, and in that way he would transfer the sins, not just of him or one family or one man, but the sins of the entire nation would be transferred to the two goats. The one goat would have his throat slit and his blood poured out. The other goat would be taken outside into the wilderness and let go, and he was the scapegoat. And in this very sort of symbolic way, Israel was told that through the shedding of blood, your sins will be permanently removed from you. And so God was preparing them for this great picture. By the way, I find it wonderful here that the middle of the Pentateuch is Leviticus and the middle of Leviticus is atonement, which means at the middle of the Pentateuch is atonement. And by the way, there's a sense in which that is still true today. That is no accident because as we step into the New Testament, what do we see? The center of God's message, God's revelation, the center of God's good news to us is what? Is the issue of atonement that we have sinned against a holy God, that His Son has shed His blood to remove our sins away from us, and through faith in Him and Him alone, God's prescribed means and sacrifice, through Him and Him alone, can we be forgiven and have a right relationship with God. And God was getting Israel and, frankly, the world ready for that message. And the book of Leviticus is designed to remind the people of their sin and their need for forgiveness that comes through the shedding of blood. And all of that is seen through the outline of the book. Which leads us to the last aspect of the book we want to see today. Just real briefly, I'll end here. And that is the message of Leviticus. What is the message of this book? Now, as I said, some of you have tried to read this book and you have found it difficult. Maybe you even tried to read it this week, getting ready, and you found yourself just, I do not understand, I'm so confused. And and, and listen, I sympathize, all right? In the book of Leviticus, let's be honest, we find sacrifices that we no longer offer, priests who no longer exist, and laws that we no longer obey. And as modern people, and particularly as Christian people, 
it makes the book seem really irrelevant and really useless. But listen, the point I want to show you is that if we, if we, instead of, if we look at these individual laws and we kind of back up a little bit and we sort of group them together, we can see here that the book of Leviticus is actually teaching us something and was getting Israel ready to learn something about who God is. That, that while the laws of Leviticus, listen, these laws, while they were timely and specific, The message of Leviticus is timeless and universal. These laws were specific to a culture and a context in the past, but that does not mean the message that they were trying to teach Israel and us is is not applicable today. In fact, it is extremely helpful. These detailed laws about food and clothes and skin disease and animals and birthdays and funerals and holidays, all that stuff seems weird. It's like, what what does this teach us? My friends, you know what it teaches us? That God is looking for holiness in every dimension of your life. God expects His people to be holy, holy like Him so that we might approach, enjoy, and represent Him. In other words, what Leviticus reminds Israel of, and I think reminds us of, is that God does not want you to be holy for one hour on Sunday. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. See, that's the goal of Leviticus. Israel just had to have it spelled out for them. Now we don't have those same laws. They have been fulfilled in Christ, and Hebrews 8 says they are obsolete for us today. But what do we have? We have the law of love and the Spirit who enables us to fulfill the same intentions of the law. Christ, in that sense, fulfilled the law for us so that He now, by the Holy Spirit, will fulfill the law in us. So there is a sense in which today that being under the new covenant, listen, here's the good news. We can be holy and eat bacon, praise God. So, our now listen, our holiness today will not be identical to Israel's holiness. But our holiness should still be just as intentional and obvious and dare I say thorough as Israel's holiness. We do not have the same restrictions that Israel did, but my friends, we have the same goal that Israel did. Israel was specifically told in their day and time how to honor God when it came to these issues of life and death and sex and neighbors and worship and justice. Guess what? God still cares about how you think and act on all of those issues. Today as a church, we will not look like Old Testament Israel, but we should still look unmistakably like God's special people. We are not just told in the New Testament to receive the gospel and we're done. Any more than Leviticus says, the Day of Atonement's all you need, you're done. No, no, no. There's the Day of Atonement. Why? Because the Day of Atonement brings about your forgiveness. The rest of Leviticus says, now live in light of your forgiveness. Forgiven people are different people. Forgiven people live as distinct people. Forgiven people will relate to others in a different way. And that is what we're told in the New Testament. We not only receive the gospel, but we're also told to to walk worthy of the gospel. So the expectation of holiness has not diminished one bit. The means of getting there is different. Because the law has been fulfilled for us through the person and work of Christ. So we're reminded that that holiness is how we approach Him. You can't just come and be on good terms with God because of any road that you want to take or any sacrifice that you want to bring. Listen, the only way to be forgiving and to approach God is to trust in His appointed sacrifice and that and that alone will make us holy. Once we have trusted in His sacrifice, we're not to live any way that we want. We're not to go about and do whatever we want. We are to personally live in God's appointed way. And when we live in God's appointed way that is holy, then He will bless us. And then having trusted in His sacrifice and having committed ourselves to live in His way, we no longer relate to outsiders and other people the same way that we used to. Why? Because now we are called to represent our holy God here on earth. 
We are His ambassadors. And we are ambassadors of holiness. We're not called to worldliness. We have got to get at that out of our thinking. We are called to live lives that are committed and dedicated to God. And yes, at times they will look odd to the world around us. At times it will seem strange to the world around us. As I said, thanks to the new covenant and the coming of Christ, the specific laws have changed, but the overall goal has not. Be ye holy as I am holy. And may we commit ourselves towards that end. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this just really scratching the surface of the book of Leviticus. Thank you, Lord, for what this book teaches us, even still today. Lord, we do pray and ask that you would forgive us of our sins and our shortcomings. We know that Leviticus is filled with reminders to confess our sins and to forsake our sins, to admit our sins, and to seek God's forgiveness. And so, Lord, we do that right now. Cleanse us, O Lord, not by the blood of bulls and goats, but we know the only cleansing we have now is through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, who has entered into that perfect tabernacle, that heavenly tabernacle, having brought His blood to make atonement for us once and for all. And so we trust Him. We lean on Him. And we thank You that through Him we can be made holy to approach You, to enjoy You, and Father, also to represent you to those around us. Help us, Lord, as your people to do just that. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.